Hi friends, this is Dory Clark coming to you on behalf of Newsweek, and I am here today with my good friend Henna Inam. Henna is a leadership expert and the author of the new book, Wired for Disruption. So glad to see you here, Henna. Hey, so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And hello to everybody who is joining us live. We're so glad to have you here. We always like to see who's in the audience. So please feel free to type into the chat box. Uh, let us know that you're here. Let us know where you're from. We'd love to, uh, to see who's here. And of course, we will be taking your questions throughout the course of our time together. So, uh, so be ready and feel free to type in your questions at any point for Henna. So today we are actually going to be talking about uh, a pretty cool and relevant topic, which is how do you overcome and deal with disruption during this crazy COVID era? And how do you embrace agility and start thinking in a way that prepares you for the future? And that's really the topic of Henna's new book. So Henna, we're so happy to have you here. Yeah, there it is right there. That's the, that's the, the killer prop here, Wired for Disruption. So Henna, my first question for you, I, I'm very curious. You, uh, in Wired for Disruption, you talk about various types of agility that people need to have. And one of the first points that you make, which I thought was really fascinating, is you talked about something called neuroemotional agility, that at literally an evolutionary level, we may have some challenges that prevent us from being as agile as we might want. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. And so let me first start by saying, I don't know that we can overcome disruption, right? Because disruption is here. Um, and, you know, all of my research in terms of talking to the future of work people um, and experts that, you know, disruption is sort of here to stay for us. And so what we have to do and what we get to do is learn new t tools and skill sets to be able to evolve in times of disruption. And so Coming back to your question, Dory, um, I love this notion of neuroemotional agility because it's at the very core of the other forms of agility I talk about. So there are five forms of agility. It's neuroemotional agility, it's learning agility, it's trust agility, it's stakeholder agility, and the fifth is growth agility. And neuroemotional agility is right at the center of it. And when I talk about neuroemotional agility, it means it is the ability for us to shift from states of fear and anxiety and burnout, which I know so many of us are feeling right now um, as a result of this disruption. So what happens is when any, anytime any disruption happens, um, it creates a, a, an actually neurobiological impact, right? In our, in our body brain system. And we get into this fight flight fear mode. And what happens is um, we get shut down, we get burned out, we can't think. If you've had any, experienced any of these symptoms where you feel foggy or you become fearful and start to protect your silos, those are all behaviors and impacts that we don't want to have in leadership in the workplace. And we actually have in our DNA, actually, the ability to shift ourselves from this place to a state of calm, curious, creative, which is what we need in this world, in this world of disruption where things are a lot less predictable. We need to actually move ourselves from this state to this state. The other thing that is beautiful about neuroemotional agility is once we move ourselves and we take care of moving that, what happens is we actually impact our teams. So we're able to create greater psychological safety for our teams. We're able to enable that more for our people. So many of my clients right now are asking, you know, what do I do to get engage my team members? You know, they seem to be really burned out. This virtual thing may not be working for us. And so I say that, you know, a lot of this virtual is here to stay and we've got to figure out how to evolve. Yeah, thank you very much, Hannah. That's great. And I just want to give a special shout out to some of the cool folks who are here joining us live. We have Veronica from New Jersey, Japar from Zurich. Hey, Japar. We have Debbie from Portland, uh, Richards in Kansas City, Vikash is from India, Katie is is here. Uh, I think I think Katie's in New York, right? Hey, Katie. We have uh, Jeannie from Oregon and Elisha from Zambia, Rosinda from Mexico, many more friends. Uh, so we're so happy to have you guys here. If you're joining a little bit late, please 
uh, type into the chat box, tell us where you're from. And also we are going to be uh, taking questions from you for Henna. So feel free to type in your questions as they arise. We're talking about disruption during this COVID era and how we can be just a little bit more agile in the face of it. So it's really true, Henna. Obviously, we have uh, people who are dealing with burnout who feel like they are having to adapt all the time. Uh, and one of the things that you talk about in your book that I thought was most interesting were questions of trust, that we have to be uh, forming trust much more rapidly than we have in the past. But of course, that's that's not always easy to do. Can you talk a little bit about how trust is formed and what that looks like in the COVID era? Yeah. So the thing um, about trust is that there's actually some data um, that has been, um, that has found that anytime that there is trust on teams, teams are able to be nine times more agile, right? So if you think about any team that's having to adapt, whether it's digital disruption that's happened in the workplace for them or creating new products and services or new customers, or even just responding to virtual work. Um, when teams have trust, they're nine times more agile. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing in terms of um, trust tools, what we know is that um, there's some really interesting, fascinating neuroscience that I, I talk about in the book. According to our, in our DNA, and there's been a lot of social science research done on this, when we trust somebody first, it actually makes them more trustworthy. So what happens is when teams come together and there's strong trust, it actually, you, we create sort of new neurochemicals in the brain that actually enable greater trust to happen. So a lot of times when we're in, you know, hard situations and disruptive and stressful situations where when we're in the fear, anxiety and burnout mode, um, we can get into silos and protective and control behaviors. What we want to do is do the exact opposite, which is trust our people first so that then when we do that, they actually become more trustworthy and teams are then able to be much more agile. Another tool for trust, by the way, which is also a tool for neuroemotional agility that I talked about is deep listening. Um, it actually shifts our brain from states of, you know, um, that are sort of this highly analytical task focused states to states that are much more curious and much more creative, including both ourselves and the people that we're working with. That's really fascinating. Thank you very much, Hannah. And we have uh, some new friends who are joining us live. We've got Houston in the house, Todd in New York City. We've got Lena from Denmark. We've got Chicago. Uh, we, oh, we have Carrie here. Carrie, where are you? Are you in Florida? I'm trying to remember. We're glad to have you. We have uh, Kuwait, Maryland, Czech Republic. Oh my goodness. Uh, Madrid, Columbus, Japan. Thank you and welcome everybody. We're so glad to have you. Feel free to type your questions for Henna Inam, author of Wired for Disruption, into the chat box. And if you're enjoying this conversation, please go ahead and hit the like button and hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can enjoy it as well. Uh, so Henna, one thing that you actually talk quite a bit about in Wired for Disruption is this concept of future readiness. And I think we're all thinking about this a lot with COVID, uh, it's hard to know how to be ready for the future when uh, big things like COVID are, are not necessarily what any of us predicted. What does future ready actually mean? And how can we start to get more that way? Yeah, that's such a, a good question, Dory. The first thing I want to uh, do is take a tip from the Dory book, right? And share with you that there is actually an agility quiz that you can take. Um, the agility quiz is on my website at transformleaders.tv. And if you just go to the Wired for Disruption book page, you'll find the agility quiz. And it's a free quiz you can take. And the, the quiz will tell you exactly how you can be future ready, right? So it, it gives you the answer five, you know, a set of questions, and then it gives you a, an answer that will tell you where you are in terms of these five forms of agility. It'll provide you where are your strengths and it will provide you what are some tools that you can do have to, to be able to develop yourself. So in terms of the future of uh, work and, and being future ready, 
the thing to do, the first thing to do, as I, as I talk about in the book, is to start with yourself. And it's to, to learn how to manage your emotions. So that's like shifting yourself in, your, in terms of your emotional agility, neuroemotional agility. Once you've shifted yourself to states of calm, right, and you're not in this place of burnout, but you're in a place of curiosity, the next step is what I, is, is call, what I call learning agility. And learning agility is fantastic because it's about how do you learn quickly to adapt to what's happening. I, I just uh, interviewed on my podcast uh, the chief learning officer of Novartis yesterday. And in this conversation, what he said is he said, you know, 20% of the skills that we're going to learn have a half-life of only three years. So we have to become really good. And in fact, in 10 years, most of the skills that we learn are going to be obsolete. So learning agility is the ability to learn. And then it's the ability to unlearn. So much of how we interact right, in the workplace, particularly our hierarchical behaviors, our old leadership habits need to be unlearned in order for this new world that is a lot less predictable than the old world. So things like humility, curiosity, um, are uh, checking your own assumptions are much more important than they used to be. In the old world, it was, you know, I need to be an expert. In this new world, I need to be a learner, a rapid learner. Um, and being an expert and thinking you're the expert can actually um, harm you. That's great, Hannah. Thank you very much. This is Dory Clark. I'm here on behalf of Newsweek with author Hannah Inam. If you're interested in making sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek series, this is called Better. And we interview thought leaders and business leaders about ways that professionals can make their own lives better. Uh, make sure to sign up for my LinkedIn newsletter. You can do so at doryclark.com slash LinkedIn and make sure you hit the, uh, the blue subscribe button there. You can also go to my my website, doryclark.com to get more information and sign up for my email newsletter uh, where you can find out about great events like this. So Hannah, you raise a really interesting point about learning and unlearning things. I'm actually curious, you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. You wrote, you wrote a book about it after all, Wired for Disruption. And I, I'd love to hear more about how you're applying them in your own life. What are some skills or some things as you think about it that you have learned recently and also some things that perhaps you have worked to unlearn? What does that look like in your own life? Yeah. Yeah. So in, um, in terms of the things that I have learned, um, one of the um, one of the things that I talk about as a key driver of neuroemotional agility, which is the first form of agility, is there is um, in the research that I cite in the book, there is a very predictable um, what is called the Kubler Ross change curve, right? And what happens is anytime that there is a disruption, our performance goes down. And it isn't until we learn to accept and integrate, that disruption in our lives where our performance goes back up. And one of the key enablers of getting to that point of where your performance can go up so you can be creative and curious and all of that is finding meaning, finding meaning in the disruption. And a great way to find meaning in the disruption is to think about how can I be a force for good in this time? And we've seen that now, so many healthcare workers, right? Or frontline workers or teachers, are learning how to do that. And, and their ability to be a force for good actually helps them kind of actually ride out the storm. And so quickly trying to figure out what I call, it's the purpose accelerator, right? And it's about how can I be purposeful in this time? What are the strengths that I bring? What are the talents do I have? What are the causes to which I'm called? And how do I bring all of that together to serve and be a force for good? What I learned during this time, I quickly applied and said, okay, how can I be a force for good in this time? It seems like the whole world is suffering through this. And I thought about, well, I can, I know I, I can write and I know that this is a topic I'm really passionate about. So I actually, during COVID is when I published this book. And so it's a really short book uh, because what I wanted to do is provide really actionable tools. So there's 15 accelerators that are real tools that can be applied. 
Um, the other thing I learned, which I had been thinking about, Dory, like this is this is so powerful. I've been thinking all last year. I, you know, I want to do a podcast. I think I'll go learn how to do a podcast, and it never happened until you know this disruption struck, and we're all in in our staycation mode, right? In 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 March in the U.S. And so I learned how to do a podcast. And so I'm actually interviewing some amazing people on my podcast so that we can all serve our community of listeners and and teach them all kinds of tools, right, to be a force for good in these times. So that's what I'm, that's kind of all the things that I'm learning. I think what I unlearned is it doesn't have to be perfect, right? I can just go try something. And that's what I did. The first few episodes were quite messy. But, you know, that's how you learn, right? Like you just sort of know that you're going to get better. And so I had to give up and unlearn this desire to, to be perfect. Yeah, that's such a great example. Thank you, Hannah. And it's, it's really true. I mean, in many ways, the secret to agility, uh, as I understand it, is, you know, if, if, you're, if you're moving fast, if you're trying different things, not not everything is going to work and not everything is going to be perfect. And we have to be okay with that uh, if if we're actually going to get the upside benefits of agility. I mean, if you if you decide you're going to plot everything out and plan it methodically so that it is perfect, it's probably not going to be agile enough. Is that is that true in your opinion? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think we've all discovered that we can actually move really fast. Right. Think about all the experiments that have been done. Like instead of if we had to do digital disruption, if we had to plan out for the pandemic, right, it would have taken us 10 years to plan it out. But hey, the pandemic happened and now everybody's virtual, right? It, within a matter of weeks and months, right? And so I think what I want to share with everybody is the agility is in our DNA, right? You got this. And all you got to do is unlearn some things like the desire to be perfect, the fear of failure, um, the, you know, it's okay to go do an experiment. And by the way, there's from a corporate perspective, a lot of my clients are C-level leaders, right? They've, they've risen through the hierarchy and they've, they're trying to deal in their working in large, you know, corporations. I, I work with C-level leaders in fortune 500 companies. And so there is a culture, right? Of, Here's the way things are done and you take things through a hierarchy. But I think we have to unlearn all of those rules and create quick, agile teams that come together to solve a problem. And then it's done. And then you move on to another problem that you're working to solve for. And, and I think those are the, so the unwritten corporate rules that often need to be unlearned in order for us to be agile. Yeah, thank you, Hannah and Nam. That's great. And for those of you watching, I'll say, uh, please open up. You can open it up in a new tab. Make sure on LinkedIn that you are following Hannah and Nam. Make sure, of course, that you are following Newsweek. And you can also follow me, Dory Clark, on uh, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can just go to uh, pretty simple doryclark.com slash li, and you can, uh, you can get the profile there to follow uh, me and, of course, follow our friends. So we had a great question. Question actually, kind of related to the unlearning issue. Katie wants to know how do you unlearn? Like it's it sounds like a great idea. We're bought in conceptually, but what does it actually look like in terms of the mechanics? How how might one go about doing this if you realize the value of doing so? Yeah, so such a great question, Katie. Um, unlearning actually starts by questioning your biases. So as you know, we all have biases and, you know, we tend to think of biases as a bad thing. Uh, and I think biases get a bad rap, but actually biases are really smart. And I'll tell you why. It's kind of intuitive. Our brain growing up evolutionary, our brain required anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the total calories of any human being. So a little, little organ here, 20 to 30 percent. So ev from an evolutionary perspective, our brain evolved to make shortcuts, right? Because every time you see a Brussels sprout, you don't need to sit there and say, do I like Brussels sprouts or do I not like Brussels sprouts, right? So your brain evolved to make shortcuts because it doesn't want to use up all the calories because calories weren't available then, right? We didn't have the McDonald's meals. And so, um, so biases are normal, part of being human. Now, 
what do you do with our biases? We start to become aware of our biases. And, and I have a course, I was telling Dory, I have a course on mindfulness that has been seen by over 400,000 people on LinkedIn Learning. And so you start to become aware and mindful of, boy, this is a bias I have. And it might be a bias um, uh, about certain people I like. So there's likability biases. By the way, there's like 300 well-documented biases that all of us have, right? So it's just a matter of learning to understand what our biases are and noticing our biases. And once we notice our biases, then we start to question our assumptions. And we get to say, hey, I, I think this is a confirmation bias. A confirmation bias is when we believe we're right. And then we refuse to see all of the data that's pointing to the fact that we might be wrong. And so that's a way of unlearning is to start to become aware of your biases and starting to notice a bigger and fuller picture, inviting people who you don't normally invite into a conversation to learn a different perspective and to value a different perspective. So bring, being much more inclusive and particularly in a world where things are a lot less predictable and expertise is not as important as curiosity, um, then you want to bring in all kinds of other perspectives because people are seeing the world from different places and you want to incorporate that into your thinking. Thank you. Really important point, Hannah. Katie, thank you for the question. Please feel free, guys, to type your questions into the chat box for author Henna Inam. And if you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like button, hit the share button so other people can benefit from it as well. So a terrific question came in, Hannah, from Anna. And she says, trusting in ourselves should come first. But how do you do it? How do you start? What if you have doubts about uh, about just trusting yourself? Um, any thoughts about how somebody can get started on that process? Yeah, such a beautiful question. I think um, there are so many of us that have a very loud, what I would call an inner critic, right? That has uh, that lives rent free in our heads and just keeps sort of you know saying, hey, you didn't do that right, or that wasn't perfect, or could have been done better. And so, um, you know, I, I say that, you know, from my perspective, there are a couple of tools. I think the first, which I shared about already, and I'm a huge fan of this, I'm a 14-year practitioner of mindfulness. And I, you know, similar to the lady who asked the question, um, had a very loud inner critic, and sometimes still do have a very loud inner critic. And this inner critic, critic's voice is, uh, is something that we just never, we never question that voice, right? It's like a bias we never question. So um, the thing to do is to get mindful, to just notice, ah, that's my little inner critic. Thank you for your opinion. I'm gonna still go ahead and move on and, and do what I need to do. So I think that's the first piece. The second piece that I actually talk about, a lot about in the book is whenever you're feeling this sort of sense of overwhelm, because when you don't trust yourself and you have a sense of anxiety about taking a risk, which we need to do, we need to take risks and do experiments in this world, um, it's to use this practice of self-compassion, um, which has been tested. There's over now 2,600 studies on self-compassion, and it tells us that self-compassion is the thing that actually helps us be much more resilient. Um, they've tried it with soldiers who've come back from war, have had suffered from PTSD. Um, they've tried it with healthcare workers. And what the studies on self-compassion show is that when you are learning and when you know that you can be compassionate with yourself, like when that inner critic is really loud, then you can actually extend compassion more for others, which is so important, right, in our workplaces as everybody is dealing with a lot these days. So the ability to kind of practice self-compassion and extend it actually helps you be more confident and resilient and also helps you create a better psychological safety for your teams. Such helpful advice. Thank you very much. And we have a, a particular question coming in, Hannah, from Jeannie. She is a health and well-being coach, and she was curious if these principles could apply to people who are dealing with PTSD or with addiction recovery. I can imagine that, uh, that probably all professionals and all people can benefit in many ways from some of these uh, techniques around embracing agility and around more mindfulness. But do you have particular thoughts uh, for, to help uh, Jeannie out in terms of her work with her clients? Yeah. So I think mindfulness, look, mindfulness has huge benefits on our health, right? It reduces stress. 
Um, it helps us change habits as we become more mindful of what our triggers are, right? And we start to notice ourselves in slow motion, going and repeating, falling into the same potholes, whatever that personal pothole is for us. For me, it's, it's chocolate chip cookies when I get emotionally triggered. <laughs> but That's a great now, pothole. I love just, that. Yeah, I know. With my, with my uh, mindfulness practice, I can sort of notice it in slow action, slow motion. Oh, I notice I'm going for that chocolate chip cookie. What else is available? Let me take a deep breath. Let me see if I could go for a walk. Uh, not this time, but maybe next time. <laughs> so um, not to joke about, you know, addiction and, and, and PTSD. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, make, make it a laughing point. But I, I do think that um, mindfulness is amazing in terms of its impact. And again, lots of studies done on mindfulness, self-compassion. There's a lot of studies done on self-compassion um, specifically related to PTSD. Um, and I'd ask you to, you can go look on my website. I have a great podcast interview with um, Dr. Kristen Neff, who is a researcher on self-compassion. She's written a book about self-compassion. She's a fabulous TED Talk on self-compassion. So um, I think all those tools are fantastic. Awesome, Hannah. Thank you. Point of information, we have a LinkedIn uh, user who wants to know, is your book Wired for Disruption, is it available in audio or just... Uh, just in in book format. <laughs> so it's a it's ebook and book. Currently not available in audio, and the reason why is because this is a agile version of the book. By the way, this is an agile. Look at you book. Going so, beta. Oh my goodness! I know this is a beta, right? So the phase two of the book, uh, which will include some of the stories of how the best leaders and you know are dealing through COVID. So this book, uh, we started COVID in the US in March, the book was out in June. And so we're going to, and I'm embedding podcast episodes in it. So we're gonna do the the, the other, the audio version of it once we get more, the get, get to phase two. That's right, Henna and um, Walking the Talk. Look at that, I love it. <laughs> so Henna, we probably have time for maybe one more question and a great one came in from Suzanne. She wants to know your thoughts on how can we boost our agility in contexts that just don't have a margin for failure? Uh, certainly there's some high stakes uh, environments or workplaces where the expectations are uh, really th through the roof on that. What would your advice be in a situation like that? Yeah, such a great question. So I want to just remind everybody, there are five forms of agility, right? There is neuroemotional agility, and there's no margin of failure there, right? Neuro neuroemotional agility is about you managing your own emotions, and you just try. You, you, keep, you keep experimenting, right, and, and, and see what happens. And there's lots of 15, 15 accelerators in the book to help you. Um, to to um, come back to specifically, you know, when there's no margin of failure, for example, there's, you know, life and death situations that we're getting into in, in, in hospital situations. What I would say is, you know, even in the case of drug companies, so I, I used to work for Novartis, um, which is a large global pharmaceutical company. Um, we are doing experiments, right? So even in the case of those companies, there are a series of experiments that we do in order to avoid failure that's large scale. So you can choose to fail in a very small scale experiment and it's okay, most contexts. In a large scale experiment, that's where the you know failure has huge consequences. And so I would say small experiments, um, you know, at the edge, go, go figure out if there's a little experiment you can do, you can learn from it. Talk to people that are in your team to say, hey, what kind of tolerance do we have for doing an experiment? And that such that even if we fail, we can learn something new. And right now, this is all about learning and, and learning how to evolve ourselves, our old, get rid of old habits, and so that we can face this um, decade of disruption and actually thrive in it. So true. It is all about learning. Uh, we have been talking today with Henna Inam about how do you adapt to disruption and how do you embrace agility at work and beyond? That is the book. Look at that. It's wired 
for disruption. If you would like to learn more about Hannah, you can go to her website. It's transformleaders.tv. If you'd like to make sure, learn more about me and make sure you don't miss these weekly sessions for Newsweek, our show Better at 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific, go to doryclark.com and you can sign up for my uh, email list and get a free self-assessment right there. Hannah and Am, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dory. It's always fun when you're around. <laughs> thank you so much. So great to be with you, Hannah. And thank you all for tuning in. It's a joy to be with you every Thursday at noon. We will see you next week.